I heard someone nearby calling for help. I dodged around a shell hole and over a few hummocks before I saw him. It was one of our infantrymen, and he was sitting on the ground, propped up on his elbow with his tunic open. I nearly vomited. His insides were spilling out of his stomach, and he was holding himself and trying to push all this awful stuff back in. When he saw me, he said, Finish it for me, mate. Put a bullet in me. Go on. I want you to. Finish it. He had no gun himself. When I did nothing, he started to swear. He cursed and swore at me, and kept on shouting even after I turned and ran. I didn't have my revolver. All my life, I've never stopped wondering what I would have done if I had. This was one of the many horrible sights that Lieutenant Patty King of the East Lancashire Regiment saw during the Battle of Passchendaele. Scenes like this were all too common. The Battle of Passchendaele, or the Third Battle of Ypres, was fought over a period of 99 days in the third year of World War I. In those 99 days, over 500,000 men became casualties, more than all of the casualties America suffered during the entirety of World War II. When it comes to the World Wars, huge numbers like these get thrown around easily. We of course know it's a big number, but do we really understand what it means? Are we really able to conceptualize it? As terrible as it was, Joseph Stalin had a quote that always stuck with me. A single death is a tragedy. A million deaths are a statistic. I believe the best way to get an idea of what this number 500,000 means is to read the stories of those who experienced it. I've read a lot about World War I, but the Battle of Passchendaele was what I found most horrifying. The Battle of Passchendaele was an offensive launched mainly by the British in the northern part of Belgium. The goal was to capture key ports and railways to cripple German U-boat manufacturing. The offensive began with the largest artillery barrage seen in the war so far, with the British firing a record 4.5 million shells. This again is one of those huge numbers that are difficult to conceptualize. There was something the soldiers called drum fire. Think of a drum roll. Every time that drum is struck, a shell goes off. Here is an audio representation of what it would sound like. This drum fire would happen day and night for 17 straight days. Now, you have to really imagine what it's like to be shelled. Soldiers from World War I and II often say shelling was the scariest thing they ever experienced. It was a common sight to see your pal get blown to bits, or even worse, survive being blown to bits. This means losing limbs, having your stomach torn open, shrapnel to the face, the list goes on. Bill Lockie of the Knotts and Derbyshire Regiment describes a scene where its battalion was charging German trenches under shell fire. The German field artillery was firing back, so there were shells exploding all around. The chap on my right had his head blown off, as neat as if it had been done with a chopper. I saw his trunk stumbling on for two or three paces, and then collapsing in a heap. My pal, Tom Altham, went down too, badly wounded. And Sergeant Major Dunn got a shell all to himself. The noise and the din were unbelievable. After Bill and his fellow men took the German trenches, he says that some took to wounding the dead Germans for souvenirs and continues. These chaps are turning over the bodies, rifling them, not bothering about taking cover, when all of a sudden, a shell came over. There was this tremendous explosion and the whole earth in front of us went up. We ducked down in the trench with mud and earth and debris showering down on top of us. When we got up and looked at where our chaps had been, they'd got the full force of the explosion and there they were, lying there, dead Tommies and bits of Tommies, lying all tangled up with the dead Germans. As terrible as it was, the initial artillery barrage by the British may have had an even worse side effect, something that would scar the soldiers for life. The artillery destroyed all the water drainage systems around the battlefield. Then the rains came down. You see, northern Belgium was always susceptible to flooding and in the fall months, monsoon-like rains would sweep through the region. This year of 1917 saw historical records of heavy rain. With no way to drain the water, the battlefield turned into a muddy hellhole. It looked like the moon, with the shell holes resembling craters. The only thing left were the trunks of trees sticking out like toothpicks. The worst thing was the mud. 
It had quicksand-like properties. It swallowed horses, wagons, supplies, tanks, and worst of all, men. That was what Passchendaele was known for. The mud. The soldiers described it best. Private Norman Clift of the 1st Grenadier Guards writes, Every few steps, someone would slide and stumble, and weighed down by rifle and equipment, rapidly sink into the sculching mess. Those nearest grabbed his arms, struggled against being themselves engulfed, and if humanly possible, dragged him out. When helpers floundered in as well and doubled the task, it became hopeless. All the straining efforts failed, and the swamp swallowed its screaming victims. And we had to be ordered to plod on dejectedly, and fight this relentless enemy as stubbornly as we did those we could see. This was as near to hell as I ever want to be. Now think of the wounded in no man's land, who climbed into shell holes for cover. Immobilized, the only thing they could do was sit there as the rain came pouring down. Captain Edwin Vaughn of the Royal Workshire Regiment was sitting in the trenches at night when he heard the cries for help. From the darkness on all sides came the groans and wails of wounded men, faint, long sobbing moans of agony and despairing shrieks. It was too horribly obvious that dozens of men with serious wounds must have crawled for safety into new shell holes. And now, the waters rising about them and powerless to move, they were slowly drowning. Horrible visions came to me with those cries of Woods and Kent, Edge, and Taylor, lying maimed out there trusting that their pals would find them, and now dying terribly, alone amongst the dead in the inky darkness. And we could do nothing to help them. Dunham was crying quietly beside me, and all the men were affected by the piteous cries. The next day, he wrote, the cries of the wounded had much diminished now, and as we staggered down the road, the reason was only too apparent, for the water was right over the tops of the shell holes. What do you do when a soldier who can't be rescued from the mud begs you to shoot him? Sergeant Tom Berry of the 1st Battalion Rifle Brigade was faced with a decision that no person should ever have to make. We heard screaming coming from another crater a bit away, I went over to investigate with a couple of the lads. It was a big hole and there was a fellow of the eight Suffolks in it up to his shoulders. So I said, get your rifles, one man in the middle to stretch him out, make a chain, and let him get a hold of it, but it was no use. It was too far to stretch and we couldn't get any force on it. And the more we pulled and the more he struggled, the further he seemed to go down. He went down gradually. He kept begging us to shoot him, but we couldn't shoot him. Who could shoot him? We stayed with him, watching him go down in the mud, and he died. He wasn't the only one. There must have been thousands up there who died in the mud. Barry said there must have been thousands who died in the mud. While we can't say for sure how many died in the mud, even today Belgian farmers will find bodies of those who drowned. One of these soldiers signed up for the war. Did they imagine it would be like this? Did they think they would see their pals drown in mud? This scarred a whole generation of men for the rest of their lives. How does society change when they go back home? Not to mention that these people you see drown could actually be friends from before the war. To encourage enlistment, the British would let co-workers, friends, neighbors, and brothers to enlist and fight together. How would seeing someone close to you drown in the mud traumatize you? Now, I want to give you a mental image of what the battlefield looked like, what these soldiers saw every single day. From the pictures, you can see that the battlefield was desolate. It was a muddy molasses with trees sticking out like an asparagus farm. You can see the drastic changes in the terrain in these before and after images. However, there is one thing you don't see in the pictures due to the censorship at the time, the bodies that littered the ground. It was difficult to bury the dead when poking your head above the trench could mean certain death, much less venturing into no man's land. Lieutenant Richard Dixon of the 4th Battery Royal Garrison Artillery writes, All around us lay the dead, both friend and foe, half in, half out of the waterlogged shell holes. Their hands and boots stuck out at us from the mud. Their rotting faces stared blindly at us from the coverlets of mud. Their decaying buttocks heaved themselves obscenely from the filth with which the shell bursts had smothered them. Skulls grinned at us. All around us stank unbelievably. These corpses were never buried, for it was impossible for us to retrieve them. They had lain, many of them, for weeks and months. They would lie and rot and disintegrate foully into the muck until they were an inescapable part of it to manure the harvests of future peacetime Belgium. Horror was everywhere. Let's not forget that many of these soldiers are young men, some 
were even boys. I never knew how these soldiers didn't all go crazy. Sometimes I imagine myself being transported to the battlefields of World War I. How would I have fared? One thing I know for certain is that I would have not lasted very long. It's easy to think that the people of the past are somehow different from us, that somehow the environment they grew up in made them more suitable for war. This is far from the truth. They were people just like us. They had their own dreams, their own families. They felt fear, just as we do today. The best way I can relate to these men is by the silver linings I found in my reading. The humanity that sometimes comes out in war. Let's take Bill Lockie's encounter with a German soldier. I saw movement out in front like a hand waving, and there in a shell hole was this little bloke. He was a Bavarian sergeant, and he was wounded. Not a bad wound, mind you, just a machine gun bullet in the leg. I know where he got that from. So as either Pat Brady or myself was responsible, I helped him back to the tank. He'd very sensibly taken cover in a shell hole until everything had quietened down. I carried him back to the tank and bandaged his wound. I had some chocolate in my pocket, so I gave him that, and we had a good old chat in schoolboy French. He was a nice little bloke. He told me his name was Jeff Warner, and that he lived at 25 Artillery Strasse Munich. In fact, he gave me a photograph of himself and wrote his name and address on the back. After the war, he said. After the war, you come and see me. You write, eh? I wrote my address on a piece of paper, and he tucked it into his wallet. We didn't hand him over to the stretcher bearers, for things are still a bit lively, and it was ridiculous. But we almost felt by then that he was one of us. This wasn't an isolated incident either. In many accounts, you see heartwarming acts of camaraderie. Many from both sides realize that they were only in this war because of forces out of their control. Because of the politicians who care nothing of the bloodshed. Lieutenant Patty King would say about the Germans, he was some poor mother's son, and that was the end of it. If you had to tell the friends, mothers, wives, and children of those who died what the sacrifice of their loved one was for, what could you even say? Is there any way to even justify their deaths? Perhaps you could say that their sacrifice helped bring on the era of relative peace we enjoy today. However, there is no doubt in my mind that those families would take their loved one back in a heartbeat. It's important to remember that when greater powers collide, there are always those who are unfortunate enough to get caught in the gears of history.